Bhagavan's teachings are focused on one simple aim, the annihilation of our ego. Um, uh, um, yeah. Why? Because the ego is the root of all problems. Um, so Bhagavan is, um, is concerned only with one thing, if, he, if the ego, uh, um, 
Ahandayun dain and eightumundahum. Ahandayin jail indu and eightum. Ahandayin yahumam. So if we can get rid of this ego, we all problems are solved. As long as this ego is here, we will have one, one problem after another. Arunachala mena ahame nene pava ahatebe rarupai arunachala. So eradicating this ego, that is Bhagavan's simple aim. So how are we to get rid of this ego? Bhagavan says this ego is simply a false knowledge of ourself. We mistake ourselves to be something other than what we are. That mistaken knowledge is the ego. Therefore, the only way to get rid of this ego is correct knowledge of ourselves. Therefore, only by investigating ourselves we can get rid of the ego. But Bhagavan um, presented his teachings in two different ways. He said, either investigate what this ego is or surrender it. But though he offered these as if they're two alternatives, he made it very clear actually they're one and the same thing. Because the only way to give up this ego is to investigate it. And to investigate and to, to know what we really are, we have to give up this ego. So actually they're just two sides of the same coin. He says that very simply in in Nanya, in the um, 13th paragraph, um, Anna Chintane Tavira, Vera Chintane Columbo Rudaku, Satram Idam Kodamo, Atmanishta Paranai, Irupte, Tane Isanaku Alipadam. Anna Chintane, that's attending to ourselves, thinking of ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> other than that, Vera Chintane Columbo Rudaku, Satram Idam Kodamo, not giving the slightest room for our attention to be diverted away from ourselves, to focus our entire attention on ourselves, that is giving ourselves to God. That is surrendering ourselves. That is the way to free ourselves from the ego. So in this sentence, Bhagavan makes it very clear that we can get rid of this ego only by turning our attention inwards and focusing our attention on this ego. This ego is a Uru Vachopeya Hande, Bhagavan says. It's a formless phantom. It doesn't actually exist. It seems to exist so long as we're looking elsewhere. But if we look at this ego, Tedinal Otum Pidicum, it, it, it vanishes. Because it's got, no, it's got no form of its own. It has no substantial existence. It seems to exist because we're looking at other things. If we look at it, it disappears. And when it disappears, everything else will disappear. Um, Ahande Indrel Indra Natum. If the ego goes, everything goes. If there's no ego, there's nothing else. Only what is real alone will remain. Um, and what is real is Anadi Anantum uh, Akanda Satchidananda, as he says in Upesh India. So it's so, Bhagavan's teachings are so, so simple. All, all the whole, he has diagnosed the, the root cause of it. it if you have a disease and you want to get rid of it, merely treating the symptoms doesn't solve the problem. You treat, treat one symptom, some other symptom will pop up. So there's no use treating the symptoms. We have to go to the root cause of the disease. The root cause of the disease, according to Bhagavan, is this ego. If we get rid of this, all problems are solved. So, so he focuses only on this. So in uh, Nanya, after saying that um, if we uh, uh, that is giving ourselves to God after saying that he then talks uh, in a more um, conventional way about surrender why? because in order to uh, in order to focus our attention on I we have to give up our concern about all other things we have to give no room for other thoughts why other thoughts can arise because we are concerned for our own little life as this person that we now take ourselves to be. If I, if I am attending only to myself, what will happen to my, where will I get my next meal? Who will pay my rent? Who will pay my mortgage? How I will uh, bring up my family? How I will maintain my family and everything? Everyone says we need not be concerned about this. He says, Isum um, uh, Evlo Barate Patalum 
He will bear everything. If we, we Sadhuang used to say, why we think? Because we don't trust Bhagavan. If we trust Bhagavan entirely, Bhagavan can do all, all the thinking that we need to do, Bhagavan will do for us. If we entrust all our burden to Bhagavan, he will bear it all. There's nothing we need to be concerned about. Our own, but Bhagavan has asked us just to do one thing, attend to ourselves. If we do this, he will take care of everything else. So we need not worry about anything. But in practice, very few of us have such bhakti. Very few of us have such complete faith in Bhagavan. We all say we're devoted to Bhagavan, we believe Bhagavan and everything. But we're not ready to give up a, a single one of our concerns to Bhagavan. We think that everything depends on us. We have to earn a living, we have to do this, we have to do that. But Bhagavan says, what we are destined to do, we'll be made to do. Abharava prarabdha prakaram adhikhanavan angangirintu archivipan. According to the destiny of each person, he who is for that will make them act. Yeah, angangirintu, being there, there. That means being in the heart of each one of us, he will make us act. What is to happen will, will, will uh, happen, however much we try to stop it. What is not to happen uh, will not happen, whatever effort we make. Idu uh, Vaitinam, this is certain, though one says. Ahalin monamai irike nandu. Therefore, keeping quiet is, is good. That alone is good. Keeping quiet means not rising as the ego. So, and how to not rise as the ego? To attend to it, to focus our entire attention on ourselves alone. If we have complete trust in Bhagavan, we would be doing this all the time. But I think, I, speaking for myself, and I think probably for most of us, most of our time we are thinking about other things rather than attending to ourselves. This is because we don't yet have sufficient bhakti to search a real love for Bhagavan. If we have real love for Bhagavan, we will cast all our burden at his feet and we will attend to him who is always shining in our heart to die. So he, he then says, um, Sakurakari and Galayam or Parameshwara Shakti Naditi called Kondirikiri Padial Namum Adku Adangir Ramo, Ipidi say a vendum, Apidi say a vendum. Into Sahajidipatu A. Why do we go on thinking I have to do this, I have to do that? It's because we don't trust Bhagavan enough. And Bhagavan gives a very simple analogy. If we're traveling on a train, do we carry our luggage on our head? Only a fool would do that. We all trust the train. We know whether the luggage is on our head or on the seat beside us, the train is going to carry it. So we put it on the seat beside us. In the same way, if we tr if we believe that Bhagavan is bearing all the burdens of this universe why should we take up think that we have to look, look after our burden why don't we just leave it to him but in practice we most of us are not able to do so completely but we both used to say complete surrender may be impossible now but for everyone partial surrender is possible so little by little um mella mella he says in, in Bhagavad Gita Saram, a uh, beautiful verse. Um, if I can find it. Diram said, Diram said, Buddhi in all, chitta tape, mella mella, nera se abendum, mischalana. Slowly, slowly, we have to bring the mind to that state of motionlessness. Maratane. Chittate anmobil se tidika matredavum ittaneyum indidade. Don't think of anything else. Just attend to, your, uh, to yourself. That's all that we have to do. We can't, uh, because we are of this long cultivated habit of so many gemmers, we are, our mind is constantly going outward. We're constantly thinking about things other than ourselves. We're constantly concerned about the little life of ourselves as this little person we now take ourselves to be. So how to change the, 
manapoku, the direction of our mind, mella mella, slowly, slowly, we have to cultivate this habit of self-attentiveness, of turning our attention inwards. Um, Tirumbiya handane ginamaha kankan periyamendrane naranachua. Slowly, slowly, we have to turn our mind inwards. We, we can't do this all of a sudden. We, have, we, we don't have sufficient love. We don't have sufficient spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity means the, the clarity of understanding that would give us the love to do this. We don't yet have enough love. But by gradual practice, we will, uh, we will cultivate this love. The more we try, the more we try to turn our attention inwards, the weaker our vishaya vasanas, our outward going um, tendencies, will become, and the stronger our swatma bhakti, our love to be, uh, to attend to ourselves, will grow. So instead of this, we will be replacing the uh, vishaya vasanas with satvasana. Satvasana means the, the the liking just to be. So this is the, the essence of Bhagavan's teachings. Whether we call it self-inquiry or we call it self-surrender, it's all the same. Simple thing, we do what Bhagavan tells us, we try little by little by little to turn our attention inwards. There is no one who cannot do this. If we, if we are truly devoted to Bhagavan, to the extent possible, we will try to introduce this practice of self-attentiveness into our life. And slowly slowly this will bring about a great transformation and eventually we'll be transformed into what we'll be transformed into bhagavan himself because bhagavan is what we actually are even now but we mistake ourselves to be this little person bhagavan doesn't even mean that i mean bhagavan appeared in the name and form of a human being in tiranai lived there for 54 years but what we see as bhagavan that person that is not what Bhagavan really is. That through, through that person, Bhagavan was shining. But what Bhagavan is, is the one infinite reality that is shining. He's shining in the heart of everyone as Aribu, as, a, as that awareness, that self awareness, that I. So by turning our attention inward within to investigate this ego, we are actually attending to what? We're attending to Bhagavan himself in his true Swarupa. So this is <laughs> Bhagavan's simple, simple teachings in a nutshell. So we can go on talking about some endlessly, but actually it all comes down to this. Bhagavan teachings are so simple. Why we think it's difficult to understand Bhagavan? Because our minds are complicated, because our minds are going outwards. But the more we, we, we cultivate this practice that he told us, the clearer his teachings will become. Because actually they are incredibly simple. The obstacle to our understanding his teachings perfectly is our mind. By putting aside this mind and attending only to ourselves, the clarity from which is ever shining in our heart will shine forth. And eventually, Sakalam and Virangum, Kadirali Yinamana, Jalajamala, Tidaranacha, that Sakalam and Virangum will swallow everything. Arul Nirevana, Amadak Kadale, Viri Kadiral, Yabum Virangum. He is the great light, like in a cinema, if a picture is being projected on the screen, but it, 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 the picture appears on the screen because of the black background darkness. If the, if the uh, roof blows off and the sunshine shine comes flooding in, the picture on the screen will be uh, completely swallowed by the sunlight. So also, everything will be swallowed by the light of Bhagavan's grace if we persevere in this practice. And what will then remain, we will lose this little self that we now take ourselves to be, but in exchange, what we will get, we'll get that supreme light of Vajitpara uh, Brahman, that supreme light of self-awareness. The eternal, the infinite, what alone is actually real. Bhagavan used to say people who, who are reluctant to surrender their ego, it is like someone who has a, a quarter paisa, in those days they had very small coins, they were quarter paisa 
somebody who has a little quarter paisa who's refusing, to, who's unwilling to let go of that quarter paisa in exchange for all the wealth in the world, all the wealth in the whole universe. So surrendering this ego is a, is a very good bargain. If we're interested in business, in doing a good business deal, this is the best business deal that we can ever do. Bhagavan is ready to give us everything just in exchange for our ego. Thanks, Michael. So should we uh, do the questions now? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, I have a question. So, greetings, Michael. Uh, I guess actually, it was the subject that I was about to ask. Um, perhaps you already got the question or uh, you read my mind. Um, so, the topic is free will versus destiny. In one context, Bhagavan has mentioned that what is meant to happen will happen. Yes. And what is, what is not meant to happen will not happen. So, do yes. nothing. In talks number 209, he mentioned this mentions that turning within and abiding yourself transcends both will and destiny. Yes. I get it. That's what I said. And then I said it maybe. Mm. However, from day-to-day -day perspective, I often struggle when the mind is actively pursuing activities, whether it is to earn a living or to address domestic issues or making the right choice, etc. And it often trumps the will to do self-inquiry. So my question is, how do I establish a trust and turn within? How how do you sorry how do I how do I establish a trust and turn within? Right how, uh, to establish the trust. Okay. Um, well, by the more and more we that that's what Bowen says. Mella mella. We we approach it slowly by by slowly slowly cultivating this habit of turning within. The what happens when we're turning our attention inward? What is the source of light? What is the what is the light that illumines all this world? It is Bhagavan shining in us as I. So by turning our attention inwards, we are we are turning our mind towards the light. So our our uh, our mind will be uh, refined and purified, and will shine more clearly. And the more clearly uh, the the um, the more clearly the light of of Bhagavan's grace, that the light of self awareness is shining in our mind, the more we will get Vivaka, and as a result of Vivaka, will automatically come the bhakti and their idea. Why we don't now have sufficient bhakti because of our lack of Vivaka, because we still believe that we that our happiness depends on external things. We still, though we read Bhagavan says, you yourself are happiness, there's no happiness in any of the things of the world, still our mind is going out after those things of the world. Why? Because we lack Viveka. We, we lack that clarity of uh, understanding. That clarity, the best way to cultivate that clarity is by turning our attention with you, at least slowly, slowly, slowly. And the more the clarity finds in us, the more. Um, we will treat the world and the more the only thing to surrender It's like a, 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 a snowball stuck on that mountain, just a snowball. As it rolls down, more and more snow picks up momentum until eventually it's a huge uh, board. Our bhakti is like that. It starts off just a little bhakti we need to start with. We should cultivate that bhakti by practicing what Bhagavan taught us by trying to turn our attention inwards. In, in time that will grow to be a very to our little the little bhakti we have now will one day be such a big bhakti it will consume us completely. That love alone will remain, we will disappear. And because that love is what we actually are. When I say we will disappear, this ego will disappear. And what will remain Infinite love for that. The infinite love for that. Does that? Yes, thank you. 
I'll try, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all trying. <laughs> Maybe not. It may, it may seem that our attempts are not very successful. But Bhagavan said nobody succeeds without perseverance. And he also used to say the only sign of progress is perseverance. So it doesn't matter whether we succeed or not. So long as we're trying, we're on the right track. We are making progress. It's the liking to try is the most important thing. Because that liking is the bhakti. And Bhagavan always used to say, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. Michael, I have a question. Yes. Bhagavan certainly gave, uh, like, Arunachala, the fountain, as an external symbol for us to revere. Yes. And also an external act, like Kiribala, for us yes. to do. So can you, can you sort of explain and even an external place like the Tronamala, I mean, there's yeah. even a piece about yeah. dying Tronamala can uh, give some person mukti. So how, how I mean, definitely he had a reason, our teacher had a reason. Somehow all of this leads back to self-inquiry and self-surrender. So can you please talk about why or, or what in your opinion was, or, or what in the literature it is where all yeah. these acts lead back to this whole yeah. act of surrender. Okay. What one thing Bhagavan used to say when people said, "Isn't it wrong to worship Nama Rupa when, when God is the formless uh, um, Niguna Brahman?" Bhagavan said, "As long as you take yourself to be uh, um, a name of the form of a body, you w we we worship this body every day. We get up, we give it a bath in the morning, we feed it, uh, uh, we we feed it." We clothe it, we, we brush our hair and we try to look nice and everything. That is what, uh, essentially what is happening in a temple. You bathe the, the, the vigraha, you clothe it, you offer food and everything. So it is treating just like we are worshipping this body as our, of ours, as ourself, we worship that vigraha as God. That in that way, Bhagavan explain the rationale behind what Nama Rupa Upasana. Um, and it, because, of, because our minds are going outwards, we see names and forms. We cannot, we cannot know God as formless until we know ourselves as formless. So we, even if we try to think, even if we've got an idea of God is formless, that idea of God is formless is itself a of an idea. Every idea is a type of form, it's a phenomenon. So um, we cannot worship God as formless until we experience ourselves as formless. So, um, and because our minds are going outwards, it is beneficial for us to have some external form to focus on. And uh, so, in that way, Bhagavan justified the worship of God in name and form. But why he pointed out our natural in particular, Bhagavan said this name and form has a particular power. If you, if you, if you, if you uh, the, the, the usual Hindu belief, if you have uh, facing obstacles in your life, who do you uh, pray to? You pray to Ganapati. Each name of, if you want to, uh, if well, if you want to, to the Pati, Benteshwara, every name and form of God, there's some particular. Uh, power. Uh, there for some uh, The power of God is the annihilation. Even the source of Brahman, what is that? What is the import of that story? So even Brahma had to come to our natural ego annihilation. So the very, the very, um, the very, um, Tattva of Aranatula is the annihilation of the ego. So by worshipping Aranatula, by going round the hill, it has that power to create within us that love. Um, Bhagavan says very clearly in Aranatula Patikam, um, Pathanam Pudumai Vivi Vali Kanta Parvatam 
Orudanum idane. That is, this, this hill is a is a is a magnet will, will attract the the soul. Um, well, he starts by saying, "I've seen a wonder. This it's, uh, some new thing. This magnetic hill which attracts the the souls." Um, Oru, or, orudarum is an eight. If we think of it even once, the soul who thinks of it even once, we're in cheste or the key. He will he, by by thinking of our natural, he will um, he will suppress the the cheste, the, the the mischief of the outward going mischief of our mind. Um, um, uh, Oru Orudana uh, Abhi Mukha Maha, he will turn us in within to face himself. Himself is, is because he's always shining as, in us as I, he will turn us, he will draw our mind inwards. Um, uh, it to Ade Tan Tampol Achila Maha Seda, he will make us motionless like himself. Uh, um, in in the body column is an A. He will he will take us as um, like a body, like a sacrifice. He will uh, swallow us like a like a sacrifice. Otidum um, uh, in uh, uh, sorry. Um, I used to know all this by heart. I, I nowadays I don't remember it as well as I used to. Uh, uh, yeah, he ends by saying, "Otumin uh, uh, uikal um, uh, ulam adanil uh, ulam adanil uh, oli oli if." We uh, call it Arunagiri, the great, this is the great Arunagiri which will swallow, which destroys the uh, egos of those who come to it. So Bhagavan explains there how our natural works. It works by drawing us towards it, that's drawing our mind towards it. We may not be, sometimes we may be able to go there physically. If so, that is good. Even when we're not able to go physically, it draws our mind to it. Um, and it turns our mind inwards, makes our mind motionless like itself, and there, thereby it feeds on us. So this is the power of our natural, what one explains here. So everywhere Bhagavan is talking about one thing, what he's talking about here, killing the ego. It's, it's there, whether you take our natural studi panchikam, urudhinaku, nanya, upadesh unya, Whatever, whichever work of Bhagavan you take, there's only one thing he's focusing on, the destruction of the ego. That is the only worthy goal. Because any other any goal is not achieving the ego. ego. But this ego is the root of all the problems. So the only real achievement, the only real city, he says in, in Urugun Aftu, is uh, knowing and being the reality which is ever achieved, which is ever accomplished. All other achievements, all other accomplishments, he says, are just like accomplishments in a dream. They, they, they seem to be real so long as we're dreaming, they, uh, but they disappear as soon as we wake up. So why to go for any um, any illusory achievement like that. There's only one achievement, that is knowing and being what we actually are. Uh, excuse me, Michael, this is Murti. Yes. Would you want me you to read the uh, verse uh, once? Sorry, I... Uh, Arunachalatikam. Verse number 10. Yes. I have it with me. Would you want me to read it once slowly? Oh, so yes, people... want to. yes. If the group is okay, I can read the verse once. So people who know Tamil can kind of figure out what's happening in that verse. Yes, yes, yes. I sorry, my I I, 
I used to know it uh, by heart. Nowadays, I don't recite it so often, so I don't remember it so well. And also, my pronunciation is not so good. So it's a wonderful please. verse. So I thought, yes. Sunita, is that OK if I read it? Are you able to hear yes, me? Please do. Please do. Uh, par par Pudumai, Uyirvali, Gandha, Paruvadam, Urudaram, Idnai, Urtidum, Uyirin, Setay, Udki, Urutanad, Abimogam, Urutanad, Abimogam, Irt Adai, Irt Adai. Tanpo Achalama Chaid Avinuir Bali Kodum Igud Ben Worth Women Uirga Ula Madil Wolir Uir Kodi Arunama Giri One more time Arthanan Arthanan Udumai Uir Valley Kanda Paruadam Burudaram Idanai Orthidum Uirin Shetaye Woodki Urutana the Abimidam Irta de Tanpo Kurama Chaid of Unu Yir Paligulum Yigden Orthuimin Virkar Ulamadil Ulir Uirkuri Arunama Giri Thank you. That means Tani has to face Tanadu is himself. Himself means he is shining in us as our self. So turning our attention inwards is uh, how he um, how he destroys our ego. So the question on um, how do we figure we're making progress? So somebody had asked this a few weeks back. I think there's a place where Bhagavan says there's no milestones on this path. And then in some places, he says if the number of thoughts go down. And then today you said the perseverance to turn inward. So what's the summary of Bhagavan's answer to how does one measure progress? Well, we can't really, really measure progress. But if we want, in, if we want a, a indication of our progress, it's the extent of our perseverance. Because if we persevere in the, um, what perseverance indicates, our love. If, if we want, if we set ourselves some goal in the material world, supposing I want to become a judge. So I study law, I work very hard, I, I go sit so many exams and I I slowly slowly raise up in that pr profession and doggedly I pursue that uh, I persevere in making efforts to become a judge so if, that if, if we don't persevere if halfway through we give up and say oh no I'm just satisfied to be a solicitor or something um, that shows we we don't have uh, we don't have sufficient love to be a judge but if we if our one aim is to be a judge, we will we will not mind any amount of obstacles we have to face. We will doggedly pursue that. So perseverance is the sign of bhakti, of the love for that. So it's only by bhakti that we will succeed in this path. So the perseverance is the only true sign that we are making progress. Michael, yes. I have a question. I'm a, just a beginner. Yes. Uh, when I go in search of food, <laughs> I'm, a, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm a beginner. Uh, when I go in search of who am I, I'm using I to find who am I. And that bothers me. I mean, I'm still searching I with my ego I how I can be without ego and find out I and our way. Well, the ego, the ego is what we want to be. 
So when we investigate ourselves, what we are investigating is the ego. A, a simple analogy. We in the dark, we are walking along a path with Bhagavan. And we see a snake lying on the path. So we step back in fear. Bhagavan uh, uh, says, don't worry, it's not dangerous. Look at it very carefully. And then you'll see what it actually is. If we, if we, we talk, in our view, it's still a snake. But because we trust Bhagavan, we look very carefully at that snake and we see it's a rope. So what we, what we were actually, we thought we were looking at a snake, but what we're actually looking at is a rope. So also when we, as this ego, we can only investigate ourselves as this ego. So what we're attending to is this ego. But what, what seems to be this ego is actually ourself as we really are. So if we look, by looking very carefully at this ego, we will see, oh, I'm not with finite uh, little um, uh, awareness that I take myself to be. I am the infinite self-awareness. So it's only by looking carefully at the ego that we see what we really are. But the ego is not a is not an object. It's not something we, we can't look at the ego in the same way that we can say um, attend to a thought of Krishna or a thought of Rama or um, a Murti or any any other object of meditation. They're all objects, things other than ourselves. The ego is not an object. The ego is the subject, the one who is seeing. So Bhagavan says, see the seer. Who is it who is aware of all these things? So slowly, slowly, we have to turn our attention back towards ourselves. Even though we now seem to be this ego, by turning our attention back towards ourselves, we will eventually see what we really are. So some, some people say, oh, Bhagavan taught that we should investigate the ego, we shouldn't investigate our real self because we can't investigate our real self. That is a misunderstanding. By investigating the ego, we are investigating what we really are. Because this ego is simply a, a, an illusory superimposition. What seems to be this ego is actually uh, what we really are. So if we look at this ego carefully, we will see what we really are. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, hearing you, listening to you very nicely. Maybe I'll take help from somebody who has understood you better than I. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe in future I will. But today, uh, I could not understood uh, very well what you said, but said, People here, they say, yes, 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 I will ask them. <laughs> we could at least hear it. Sorry, may I know your name? May I know your name? This body's name is Vinay. Vinay Shukla. Oh, I don't know my name, but body's name is Vinay Shukla. <laughs> so, Vinay Shukla. Vinesh, is it or Vinesh what? Vinesh, you said? Vinesh Shukla. Okay, Vinesh. If you feel I am Vinesh. If I ask you who are you, you'll say I am Vinesh. Vinesh is the name of, of, a, of a... When you say I am you are... Or what is that? It's a mixed awareness. In that I am Vinesh, there's the I am portion and the Vinesh portion. Now you feel I am Vinesh. But when you're uh, sleeping, for example, you don't feel I am Vinesh. You're just aware that I am. So Vinesh is, is a superimposition, superimposed upon I am. We're mistaking, uh, we're mistaking uh, Vinesh to be what I really is. So these two, it's a mixed awareness. So this mixed awareness is what is called ego. It's also called chit jadagranti because the, the I am is the chit, the awareness. The uh, Dinesh is the name of a body. The body is jada. So we are mistaking this jada body to be ourself, to be the awareness. So the body seems to be aware. Why? Because we are aware. 
And because we identify the body as I, we feel the body is aware. But is it, is, is it, this body, what is it? It's just insentient matter. Is a dead body aware of anything? No, because the ego, because there's no longer an ego functioning there. Because of the ego functioning in this body, that this body seems to be aware. So this ego is a mixture of of the pure awareness and the jada upadis, the, the non-sentient upadis. So when we are attending to ego, what we're attending to, we don't we don't go and sit in front of a mirror and look at our face in a mirror and think we're attending to ourselves. No, we have to turn our attention back to the awareness. Who is aware of this, of, of myself as Vinesh? Who is it who says, I am Vinesh? So we turn our attention back towards that mixed self-awareness, I am Vinesh. And the more we focus on the, on the basic awareness, the more the Upadis will slip, the Upadis will slip off. The Upadis seem to be clinging to us, or we seem to be clinging to the Upadis because we allow our mind to go outward. If we turn our attention within to face the I alone, the Upadis will slowly, slowly slip off, and we'll get more and more clarity what is really meant by self-attentiveness. At first it seems hazy, but by, by persistent practice, it becomes clearer and clearer. I hope that helped a little bit more. I yeah. thought the question, I think, think, oh sorry, clarify one thing. I think the question, the way I understood what Vinay was saying is, we are starting the inquiry with the false eye. Yes. How yes. can we be sure that when we start an inquiry with a false eye, that it will lead to the real eye? The question well, was yeah. different than in that sense. So okay, how, yes. how, how many how many eyes are there? Is anyone aware of more than one eye? There is only one eye, but now we mistake this eye to be a person. This I am this person, that mixed awareness, that mixed self-awareness is that the uh, adjunct mixed awareness is the ego. So, but in this ego, there is a real element. That real element is I am. That is what we really are. So when we turn our attention towards the ego, we're turning our attention towards I. So the more we focus on the I, which is the essence of the ego, the more the upadis will drop off. And the, uh, like when, when, we, when we see the, the rope lying there, we mistake it to be a snake. At first, we're fully convinced that it's a snake. So we're very afraid. But because Bhagavan tells us to look at it, we look at it and then we begin to doubt it's not moving is it maybe it's not a snake or maybe it's a snake sleeping we get some doubt and then we but we we now we're curious is it a snake or is it something else so we're we're a little bit afraid but we go a little closer to the, the more closer we go the more we see it the more it, it becomes clear to us but well maybe it isn't a snake but what is it then and finally we see clearly it's a rope then once we, as soon as we see it's a rope, we can never again mistake it to be a snake. So that is how the ego is annihilated, by seeing what we really are. What, the ego is a wrong knowledge of ourself. It's a mistaken awareness of ourself. We're mistaking ourselves to be something other than what we are. By looking at ourselves carefully, we will see what we really are, and the illusion that we have this ego will vanish forever. It's actually very simple, but it, it seems difficult when we first start out on it. I mean, it seems, it seems vague and hazy, but the more we practice, uh, try to cultivate this habit of practicing self-attentiveness, the clearer it will become. Uh, Michael, who is focusing on I in me? Uh, who is focusing on I? Who is looking? Who who needs to investigate themselves? Only the ego, because it's only the, our real self is never ignorant of itself. It is always shining as pure self-awareness. It's as this ego, but we seem to be ignorant of what we are. So it's this ego who needs to do who needs to investigate itself, and it's this, the investigation is done by the ego, and it's investigating the ego. 
but by investigating itself, who seems to be the ego, it sees what it really is, and then there's no more ego there to say, to, I mean, the, the ego is there, thereby annihilated. So it's by the ego investigating itself that it annihilates itself, and what remains when the ego is eradicated, erased, uh, eradicated, is what is the I in its pure form, which is Bhagavan, which is our natural, which is what our self as we really are. Uh, I, I believe the trouble is you investigate and you come with an answer. That's the point. <laughs> I think that's the that's probably the conflict. Start investigating and you come with your own answer. That's... Yeah, maybe you can ask Michael. So Bala was saying that if you investigate and you come up with an answer, you're probably on the wrong path. Because you're well, yeah. if the answer is in the form of a thought or something, then it's it's the wrong answer. The only answer. The, the correct answer is the clear self-awareness, the clear awareness of ourself as we actually are. So long as I feel I am Michael investigating myself, I haven't yet experienced what I really am. When, when this I who is now investigating experiences itself as it really is, there will be no more Michael, there will be no more world, there will be nothing. With Sakalam and Viridam, everything will have been swallowed. So, Michael, when the mind is in a calm frame of mind and you're practicing self attentiveness, it's obviously easy. But let's say you're consumed with ag agitation for whatever reason, <coughs> at that moment, let's say anger, then yeah. after the fact, it's kind of easy to see that, yes, I lift and kind of forgive yourself perhaps but have you known other than Bhagavan of people like Sadhu Om and other people who catch them at the point that the agitation rises and don't even fall yeah. for that well we, we, we can't know anything about other people even Bhagavan sometimes used to get angry he's not really angry but it's necessary for the according to the um, like he says in Ulivnapyan Bandam, some verses uh, translated from Yoga Vashista, actual uh, that is Vashista telling Rama, having known all that is to be known, play your part in the world. Ulihavilyata Vira. That is you 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 so Bhagavan played a role. Sometimes when appropriate, he got angry. So we cannot tell from the uh, we, we can't say, oh Bhagavan got angry, therefore he's uh, He's, he's still um, not able to control his anger. He still succumbs to the Vasana or my, it's not, we, If we try to judge who is Nyani and who is not Nyani, we are sure to go wrong. Bhagavan, Bhagavan said there is only one Nyani. You are that. In, inquiring about whether this person is Nyani or that person is Nyani is, is ignorance. Because so long as we see manyness, we are ignorant and we cannot see who is Nyani. So it, it, we, we, we shouldn't be concerned about other people. We should be concerned about ourselves. Coming back to your question, when our mind is relatively calm, it's obviously a favorable time to attend to ourselves. But even when our mind is agitated, who is agitated? I am. So I is always there. Whatever state of mind we're in, it's always I who is in that state of mind. So there's never a moment when we cannot attend to ourselves if we want to. So we 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 shouldn't just be waiting for. Um, Sadhuam used to say, people who say, "Oh, first I have to calm down all the thoughts, then I can attend to myself." That is not the right way to go. Even in the midst of a storm, we have to attend to ourselves. If, if there's a lot of waves on the ocean and a pearl diver sits and waits, I'll wait till the ocean becomes calm, then I'll dive down and get the pearl. The ocean will never become calm. Some days it's more, it's more choppy, other days it's more calm, but it's all relative. There's always waves there in the ocean. So if we want to get that pearl, we have to ignore the waves. If, however stormy it may be, if we dive down beneath the waves, 
deep down in the ocean, there, there aren't, there's no storm, there are no waves. So we had to plunge through the uh, superficial activity of the mind to attend to who is aware of this activity, who is aware of this agitation. And that way we dive beneath the surface of the, the surface agitation, and that is the way to get the pearl. Yeah, so following up on that, forget other people, yourself. So it's so easy to justify that you're just showing anger because you need the house to function, because the anger is usually against the spouse or the child. And so I can easily justify to myself that, yes, unless I show the anger, things won't work. How do I, uh, what's the test for myself that that's the Bhagavan style anger or whether it is bad anger? We, we, we cannot tell, we cannot know. There are times when we get carried away by anger. When we're carried away by anger, we're carried away by anger. We shouldn't try to justify our anger afterwards because otherwise, we, we, as far as possible, we should try to curb our anger. We should try to, um, the more we, we follow the path of self-surrender, the more we accept whatever happened as being Bhagavan's world, the more we accept whatever difficulties we face, the less we will feel inclined to be angry with the world. There's only one person we should be angry with, this ego, who is the root of the anger. So we should we we will we should direct our anger back at why am I getting my why do I allow this small irritation to anger me so much? We should get angry only with our own ego, not with anything else. So I, we, we, we shouldn't try to justify getting angry, but Bhagavan said, when, if you've done something wrong, don't think about it. Turn your attention, who, who think, feels I have done something wrong, I have lost my temper, I, I unnecessarily got angry. Who is that? If we thinking, oh, I lost my temper, how am I, uh, I, I'm quite unfit for the spiritual path, if we start regretting it, where, what are we attending to? We are attending to this little person, instead of to the I who takes this little person to be itself. We want to ignore the person, Michael, who gets angry every day. Who is the I who feels this Michael, this angry fellow called Michael, is, uh, is I? We have to turn our attention in, forget about Michael, forget about Michael's anger. Who is I? who is aware of this Michael, who feels I am Michael, I am getting angry. In that way, if we divert our attention away from the anger and away from a person who gets angry, back to the I who is aware of that anger and aware of itself as that person, the, uh, that is the way, uh, the way forward, the way we have to progress. Uh, Anita, Michael, uh, uh, am I allowed to ask one question? I'll yes, just please stick please. it to one question. Yes. Sunita, is that okay? Do we have yes. time? Okay, I'm not able to hear Sunita, so I'll assume that she is saying okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, the question kind of changes gear a little bit. Uh, Michael, we all know you, and I'm sure all of us, uh, uh, all of the folks there will also agree with me. We all know you as an intense seeker. So you you, you seem to be, based on your words, based on what we have heard, uh, you seem to be a very intense seeker, immersed in Bhagavan's thoughts, Bhagavan's teachings, Bhagavan's works, uh, and sharing that uh, with, uh, with the others, as well as uh, ruminating on these uh, uh, a lot. Uh, would you be able to share your typical day as a seeker, which I'm asking primarily because it could inspire many of us. How does your typical day go? What do you do from waking to going to sleep? If you may be able to share, it'll, it'll be really appreciated. But if you cannot, that is understood as well. Right. Well, um, well firstly, I, I, I'm not such an intense seeker as I may seem to be. I love Bhagavan's teachings, but um, I, I am aware of my own shortcomings. I still have strong Vishaya Vasanas and I'm still, I'm still very, very far from perfect. So 
um, my mind goes out, though I talk all these things, my mind is still going outwards, my mind is still concerned about uh, the little difficulties of this life of this small person called Michael. So I, I am as much, uh, um, I, I am probably in much the same position as most of you. I, uh, just because I, I was fortunate to be brought to this path very young and I have been able to devote a lot of my life, a lot of my time to thinking about this and everything, I may seem to be a very, um, a very uh, serious seeker, but it, I am not, uh, <laughs> I, I, I am still very, very imperfect. But I, one thing, I do trust Bhagavan. I do uh, pray to him to give me more and more love to try and put this into practice. And I dwell on his um, teachings as much as possible. I like to talk about them. I like to think about them. I like to write about them because this keeps my mind on them and constantly is reminding me of the need to turn within. So um, I don't have any fixed routine. Um, I just have to take life as it comes. Some days I'm able to spend more time um, doing, I mean, my main work is, is writing, replying to emails, replying to questions on my blog and everything. So I try to do that as much as possible. But I have family, I have family commitments. And we all, I mean, life is always uh, throwing unexpected things at us and distracting us away from what we should be doing. Not that that's any excuse, but uh, it, it does, um, it doesn't, I mean, I think uh, in my experience, a regular routine is not possible because I have to take each day as it comes. Um, some people find it useful setting aside a particular time each day for practicing self-attentiveness. I don't find that so useful. I just try to be self-attentive as much as possible whenever I can be. Of course, it's useful sometimes to have some quiet moments just to sit and uh, um, turn within uh, with greater intensity. But even in the midst of activities, we should be trying to attend to ourselves. Um, so I don't think there's really anything very useful I can say about my external life. I live a mundane life like everyone else. I'm just fortunate that I'm able to spend more time probably than most people um, thinking about these things, writing about these things. And I mean, I, I don't know if... It, if anyone is benefited really by anything I write on my blog or anything like that, but at least I feel I'm benefited because if nothing else, at least my mind is dwelling upon Bhagavan's teachings and um, I'm being reminded that I should be spending more and more of my time trying to attend to myself. So I think that's all I can, I can say about my, my, uh, my daily routine or my life or anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just like anyone else, really. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. So it's 11 o'clock. Thank you very much for your time. Right. right. Yeah. Thank and you, everyone, for including me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to disconnect soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.